Hello and welcome back to sax.co.uk. So we've all been there at some point when it comes to playing the saxophone, playing live. So that could be playing in front of your friends and family, or it could be playing in front of a small crowd of people, or maybe in a recital hall for an exam or something like that. Now, my guest today has played the biggest stages of them all. We're talking Glastonbury, the O2 Arena. We're talking on television in front of all the people on the planet. Well, maybe not all of them, but quite a lot of people. I am, of course, joined today by John Woff, the amazing saxophonist and a friend of the store. Hello. Hi, mate. How are you doing? I'm a good man. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited to dig in and start talking a little bit about your experiences playing with the 1975 and other fantastic people like that. But before we go there, let's go back in time. Mm -hmm. Take, you know, mind palace this. We're going to go back in time and think about the first times you were playing the saxophone. Give me a little bit about your journey from starting the saxophone to today. So I first started taking lessons when I was 10 years old. 10 years, good and, age. Yeah, and prior to that, I was taking piano lessons for a couple of years. And um, I was very fortunate that I had an amazing saxophone teacher from the very start, a guy called Gary Cowie. And for about eight years, he was my teacher. And um, alongside Gary, some amazing um, musical directors who were running youth ensembles, both in and outside of the schools that I was attending. And um, it just became a really big part of my childhood and upbringing and I suppose inherently my social life. And so up until this day, it's the, my work and social life cross over so much. And so with that in mind, it was, it was such a natural thing for me to be involved with when I was younger. Um, and I, I took to it very quickly. I, I think, again, I was just so fortunate to have the right teachers around me to point me in the right direction. and. Um, they were so encouraging, and I think when you're when you're very young, you're naturally quite um, impressionable, and and so when you find like-minded friends that are doing the same thing, um, it just it plays out and unfolds, and it it was just a very natural thing for me, um, and then it led to me going to a music college, and I, I I did a jazz degree at Leeds College of Music, and. I suppose that was maybe the first um, significant step in terms of making real progression and um, sort of fleeing the nest, I suppose, as a musician. As a musician, uh, you've got quite a varied, um, you've got quite a, quite the tool set when it comes to being a musician because you've worked with a lot of very different artists. So your work with, uh, you're going to forgive me if I say this wrong, Pliny, isn't it? Yeah, Pliny. Pliny, yeah. amazing. Uh, with this sort of progressive rock sort of heavier stuff and compared to the 1975, which is a bit more of that sort of standard, more modern pop stuff. Uh, do you have any saxophone, saxophonist inspirations, like people that have inspired you? Because those two skill sets are very, very different. Yeah. Um, and so it's not that these two guys, two or three guys, that have played in heavy, progressive guitar-driven music, but um, they've certainly played outside of jazz music, but haven't come from a jazz background. So uh, Branford Marsalis, mm -hmm. and in particular his work with Sting, um, Bob Reynolds with John Mayer, um, and of course, f for both of those players, their work as solo artists and countless other collaborations. Um, and I think basically anything that Michael Brecker has ever played with anyone. Um, but I suppose within pop music, the, some of the work he did with Paul Simon, there's that amazing live at Central Park uh, performance where he was quite heavily featured in, um, as a soloist. Um, but it's basically anyone who, not just saxophone players, but people who bridge the gap between I suppose jazz music and anything else which is groove based, anything which has a um, some kind of tether to pop and rock music. Um, I find that sweet spot really interesting. And the players that I've just mentioned, I think are particularly good at doing that because they, they're they not there to simply show their jazz chops. They 
understand the, the direction of the artists that they're working for. They're there to really serve the music. Um, it's like a taste driven thing more than anything. And, and I, I suppose you, you can't really teach that. You can't teach artistry or taste. It comes about through really through collaboration and listening to as many different things as possible. And I think um, for as long as I can remember, I've, I've been a, a music of pop and rock music just as much, if not more, than jazz music. Let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Let's say uh, you're approaching a solo with Pliny, say the pan solo, which I love, and it's amazing, like the progression, it seems to just sort of ramp up and it's sort of very, like it's, it feels like a natural story being told versus something with the 1975, uh, where it feels like it comes in like a cannon immediately. So what, what approaches do you take to building out a solo when you're working with such different artists? Um. Well, with uh, uh, the 1975 or the majority of pop bands or artists that I've done session for, it, it's, it's easier to find your footing with that kind of material, I suppose. Um, I tend to try and take ideas that already exist within the tune. If I even have the freedom to do that, quite often there's, there are set melodies or ideas that I'm, that I'm asked to play. Um, but if you have eight or maybe even four bars over a, a bridge section or something. Um, it, it just comes down to serving the tune. I, I try not to think too deeply about it. Um, the simpler, the better. And I, I try to keep the ideas just simple and effective and played with a good sound. Um, and I, I don't think it really requires any deeper thought, really. Um, but I suppose good communication between yourself and the artist. Um, but with Pliny as an example, and that kind of musical environment is far more, the, the parameters are far more open. It's, it's kind of, it's progressive music. His influences are uh, not, I mean, I, I don't really want to speak on behalf of him, but from conversations I've had with him would be really heavy bands like Meshuga, but then also Pat Metheny. And, and so there's, a lot of con like heavy conviction behind what he plays, but then his compositional ideas are quite intricate and, and really interesting. And so as a soloist, it, it gives me the, just a bit more freedom to, to play some uh, just slightly more extended ideas for, uh, to speak in generalizations. And um, given the length of that solo as well, there's, there's so much time to develop ideas. And, I, and again, I try not to think too deeply about it. I, I try to find simple ideas that I can develop over the course of the solo. We wouldn't be remiss without talking about your setup. I mean, every yeah. saxophonist wants to know that straight away. Otherwise, it'll be in the comments and they'll be yelling at me. Um, so setup wise, uh, saxophone, you're playing a six, I believe. Yeah. So um, I've only had this for a few years, but it's a it's Selma Mark six. It's a six digit. So it's a, a two zero eight. A 70s one. -ish. Yeah, yeah, 1972. Yeah. Um, and I think it still has. I think this is the original neck with it. Um, and I mean, you can kind of just see that it's it's lived it's been well loved of, yeah it's lived a lot of life um and it has next to not none of its original black left there's a little bit down here but that's the way they should be i love yeah. them when they're a bit beaten up like that uh mouthpiece wise what's your go-to um it's a morgan fry oh. um which sadly are very hard to come by now. yes um and uh but my friend who based in leeds has an amazing uh, music shop called All Brass and Woodwind, yep. called Dave Walker. Um, at the time when I got this, he was collaborating with Morgan Fry, and he was pairing these mouthpieces with his own saxophones that he's making. Okay. Dave Walker saxophones, they're, they're incredible. Um, and so I think this, it might even be a prototype from something that they made, but it's, 
I don't actually know, know, know too much about it, but it's a seven star. And you like it. And I really like it. And, <laughs> and I've got a, a little Selma ligature there. Nice. And for years I'd played a Rovner, but, um, and I've got Dodario Reeds. Yes, the Dodario yeah. Reeds is something I want to uh, touch on because uh, when you're playing with, uh, you were talking before about crafting the solo, uh, these bands are very particular, right? You've got to be this way and do this thing. So consistency is massive when it comes yeah. to this. So what is it about Dodario Reeds that is really calling out to you? Is it a sound thing or is it the consistency? Well, it's, it's both. Oh, both and was. Yeah, so they're, they're very consistent um, and my, my general philosophy on gear and equipment for saxophone is that um, if I'm thinking about it too much, then it's probably not right for me. And um, I'm looking for something that is really comfortable to play, something that I'm not fighting against. And um, I've, I feel like I've really, really, really settled on this now. And um, there's, I, I suppose, to be more specific though, I'd, I'd like to find a good level of resistance against the air that I'm putting into the horn. And because um, I naturally have a very bright sound and I like things to be free blowing, but not to the extent where I'm flying by the seat of my pants and things are about to break and squeak or something. So I'd, I still kind of like something which pushes back a little bit. Um, and, but yeah, I, I, I really don't think too deeply about it. I think um, as with anything in music, really, it's, it's more of like a feel based thing. And I want to be more focused on just the music I'm playing. And um, I just need to find a degree of comfort on the instrument to help me to do that, I suppose. <laughs> Some of our fantastic viewers might be thinking about booking these kinds of gigs. Obviously, booking the 1975 is absolutely massive. <laughs> but like, what can you tell me a bit about the process of getting booked for that, say, um, that mega band idea? Because it, it can happen. It can happen to you too. Not for me, but it can happen for you too. So, tell me a bit about that process. Well, I think, regardless of the the type of break or opportunity. It, it, regardless of it being a huge pop band or a small up and coming local artist or just a, a local band within your scene, it, it always comes about through the, the people that, that you know or the people that know of you. And I think if you're really active in your scene, uh, you're gonna get the call for something because people will recognize your sound that, that, that will perhaps, um, if you're busy enough, that will, um, uh, precede you, you know what I mean? You'll, you'll, there's, there'll be a certain musical blueprint that you have, which people will recognize. Um, and so it, it just comes about circumstantially, you know, um, that there's no set way of, of anyone becoming successful in music. There are, you really do have to carve your own path. And I think something that gave me a bit of an advantage was that, um, well, first and foremost, I just knew Matty Healy when we were growing up. That's the most significant thing about how I got the opportunity. I think he was probably the, sorry, I beg your pardon. I think I was the only saxophone player that he knew. That's always helpful. <laughs> um, so that's particularly advantageous. But fortunately, we shared very similar taste in music. And at the time, um, I had already been working on trying to be a pop session player for a little while. N not that I was getting a lot of sessions, I was only 23 or 24 at the time when I first recorded with them. And, but I was actively listening to people like I mentioned before, like Bob Reynolds with John Mayer. I was obsessed with YouTube videos of Bob playing with John. And so I transcribed a ton of his stuff. And I was just trying to copy those guys. And so I think um, the work that I had done leading up to that had, it really allowed me to take that opportunity in my stride it felt really natural and um, both musically and then just on a social level as well. We're, we're the same age and I've always had the same kind of, yeah, musical taste. It was, it, 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 it simply happened, it played out and it worked out in, in my favor. And um, 
it was purely circumstantial and I was extremely fortunate. And I think w when I think about it, my other musician friends, I think it, things just seem to appear because they're proactive and busy and saying yes to as many different opportunities as they can within reason and they're, they're willing to, to put themselves out there and you know play hundreds of gigs sometimes they're brilliant sometimes they're going to be horrendous and humiliating and I've, those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but my god and, and you have to do it it's it's part of the the rite of passage uh i beg your pardon rite of passage to to go through all of those kind of experiences and um and so I, I, the short answer is i think most people know how it comes about and it's just through being as getting out there and being as, as busy as you can and saying yes to opportunities and you slowly begin to make progress. You just have to invest in time probably more than anything else. And I have to talk a bit about uh, the Glastonbury experience. So uh, tell me a bit about Glastonbury. Tell me a bit about playing in front of that many people and in, on, yeah. for, for a televised audience so big as well. What, are, you, are you cool as a cucumber? Are you, are you terrified? What's the feeling going through playing that stage? Well, the, it's the televised thing, which um, still to this day gets me a little nervous. Mm. Um, the, the bigger audiences, I think, are... I think people would be surprised how quickly you can acclimate to that. And if anything, I think I'm more nervous playing in front of smaller, intimate crowds mm. because you can see everyone and you can see people's... And, and, and again, it's, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. You, you see people's reaction in real time and there's this shared experience, which is a wonderful thing. And so um, I certainly don't shy away from the intimate performances, but with those larger crowds at festivals or arenas, it's, it, it, it kind of feels easier because there's more of a separation between the band and the audience. Um, but the, the very first time I ever went to Glastonbury, I was playing there. This was in 2014 with 1975, and we were playing, I think, maybe one or two acts before Dolly Parton on the Sunday afternoon on the pyramid stage. Wow. And so she, we kind of capitalized on her crowd, really. And so I think there were, there was about 80, 90,000 people there. And, and I can remember at the time I was um, using like a clip on mic. And at this stage, I only played on a few tunes. And so I'd walk on to play a solo, stay on for a couple of tunes and walk off again. So I'd walk on halfway through a tune and then play over the middle eight of a song. It's a tune called Heart Out. And I was on quite a long cable, and so I was going to ha have to drag that along with me. But our production manager at the time said that he'd kind of feed it out as I was walking on stage, and then he'd kind of essentially throw the rest. But as he threw it, it landed. It kind of got hooked onto like, it was just one of, the, one of these. It got hooked on a part of the saxophone, so I had to frantically grab it, throw it away, maybe about a beat and a half before I played the first note. And so that, if you're, yeah, my, and my very first experience of Glastonbury was, was quite terrifying. <laughs> and it could have gone drastically wrong, but thankfully I got the cable out of the way and I was able to Get play going. in it. And, it was, and then it, as soon as we started playing it, it was certainly one of the most exhilarating experiences of my career. It's an, a, an unbelievable festival and we've been so fortunate to, to travel a lot of the world and play some really renowned festivals. But I think Glastonbury, it, it just is the best festival on the planet. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's kind of an undisputed thing now. Yeah, and I think that's I, and I, I really do mean it as well. It's, um, it's very hard to beat Glastonbury. That's amazing. Well, touching on the uh, touring side, um, world touring, uh, it, that sounds intense. It sounds tiring just thinking about it. Like, have you got any tips for, again, for any players that might be going on a tour of some kind just to keep themselves practiced or not burnt out yeah um it's just the you know usual things of you, you try and sleep as much as you can <laughs> you try and eat well um and and it's yeah there's nothing it, it's it's quite a boring answer really but it's it's so important um 
think your age, if, you, if, you're, a, you know, if you're a young person, it kind of helps because I can remember when I first started touring, um, I just felt like I could do anything. I was so full of energy and it didn't matter how jet lagged I was. I, was, I had all the energy in the world to play a gig. Um, I was so excited and bright eyed and bushy tailed to, to fly anywhere at any given time. I was just, I was so hungry for it. Um, and I still am, I, I, I really, really love touring, but then not that I'm an older guy, but the older you get, you in inherit new responsibilities and there's new things to take care of. Your ties at home become more significant. And so probably a big thing for me now is, is really striking a, a healthy balance between my tour life day to day and my home life day to day. And that's the most precious thing to me at the minute. Um, but then that's probably more of a personal thing. But I suppose in terms of the music and keeping on top of your playing, um, just treat it like any other gig. You would go into any, say if you're working in London beforehand, you want to be warmed up. You want to make sure your equipment's in good working order. You want to be prepared and know the material. Um, I think all of that should be a given, really. Um, but when you think about how much time you spend playing music, like the percentage of time spent playing music on, on, a, on a show day is very small compared to when you're sitting in a room or a shared space, a tour bus, on a flight, dressing room um, with other people. And tour campaigns can be anything from, you know, between, I don't know, six months or two years. And the, the second album campaign I did with the 1975 was 22 months. And we were playing, for the most part, the same set of music. A couple of things were added here and there. Um, and I was with the same group of guys for that length of time, you know, and when you're jet lagged or you're hungry or you, whatever, you, you just wake up. Because regardless of how exciting the gigs are, you still wake up some days and you're, you're still you're faced with the fundamentals of being a person. And so sometimes <laughs> you're just a bit, Lost. yeah, you're just a bit grouchy sometimes. And so it's important to just remember that maybe when you're in a van on a nine hour drive, that's not the time to, to start complaining about things or whinging about anything. It, it, you have to be very considerate of other people's space and time. And um, I think one thing that's helped me is that I've, I'm quite a quiet person, generally speaking. Um, I'm not particularly talkative. I'm quite shy. And so that's putting you in front of a camera to oh, me no. asking you lots of questions. Was <laughs> you guys have been very friendly and very lovely. So I, you've made it a lot easier. But, um, but no, it's, and so that's, if anything, it's worked in my favor because um, I like to think hopefully um, I, I don't annoy people all the time. I'll, I'll, maybe I've had moments, but I, you know, hopefully that you, you get my point. I get your point. Yeah, 100%. Well, John, I think I've asked you every possible question I could possibly ask you at this point. <laughs> I can't extract any more information out of you. That would be a bit cruel at this point. I've kept you for long enough. So thank you so much for your time. It's lovely to chat to you and catch up with you and um, pick your brains a little bit. And thank you for watching. Please be sure to like, share and subscribe and leave a comment below. Uh, and yeah, check out everything John Roth does. Like everything, everywhere. Do it all. <laughs> buy his book, buy the albums, all of the stuff. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.